Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, I will read one text in the New Testament, and then I will go to the Old Testament for a text and then bring a message. Now, tonight's message is a little different in style from my normal message. I want you to, uh, my normal style of preaching, I want you to listen carefully tonight. I'm going to ask this evening that you put your mind into high gear with me as we go into some details this evening, and I think it will be a blessing and challenge to you. Ephesians chapter 6. Begin reading, looking down, if you will, please, at verse 13. Ephesians 6 and verse 13. The Bible says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Paul describes the sword of the Spirit. He says that is the Word of God. The Bible, then, is described as a sword. And he says that the Word of God, the Bible, is the sword of the Spirit. Now take your Bible and turn to 1 Samuel 21. Remembering, if you will please, the description of Paul regarding the Bible, the Word of God, as the sword of the Spirit. We believe that the Bible, the Word of God, the 66 books that comprise the Bible, that is what is meant by the Word of God, that is the sword of the Spirit. Now 1 Samuel chapter 21 Verses 8 and 9, before we read those verses this evening, let me say that this is the passage that describes one of David's flights from King Saul. He had found out from Jonathan that King Saul meant only to do him harm. And so David is fleeing from the presence of Saul, and he goes to Ahimelech the priest. Verse number 1 of the 21st chapter tells us that Ahimelech was nervous to have David in his presence. Doubtless Ahimelech had heard concerning the conflict between Saul and David. David, though, as a fugitive, ran to the priest for help, a man doubtless that he knew. And in verse number 8, David makes a request. The Bible says in verse 8, And David said unto Ahimelech, And is there not here under thine hand spear or sword? For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take that, take it, for there is no other save that here. And David said, There is none like that Give it me. There is none like that. Give it me. Now, of course, David spoke of the sword that Goliath had used in battle. Doubtless, there was none like that. It was unique. And David said, based upon its uniqueness, doubtless its size, its heft, perhaps its sharpness, perhaps the material from which it was forged, we are not told. But David said, there's none like that. Give it me. Now, given the New Testament reference to Paul saying that the Bible is the sword of the Spirit, we then find David seeking a specific sword, the sword of Goliath, and he says, there is none like that, give it me. Tonight I want to speak on this topic, why fundamentalists should continue using the King James Bible. Now, I'm well aware that this topic stirs controversy among some But I think, ladies and gentlemen, it is important that we understand there are reasons for the things that we do. Somebody will ask occasionally, I had this asked to me last week uh, by someone visiting in our church, they said, Pastor, do you use the King James Bible? And I said, yes, I do. And then the thought occurred to me that there may be a number of folks that have come into our church that have never asked me but wonder. Why does this church use the King James? After all, the Bible versions are changing rapidly in churches around us. Why is it that we stand with the King James Bible? Well, let me give you tonight a little idea from the standpoint of position. I was saved in January of 1981. 
Prior to getting saved, I was uh, enrolled in a fundamentalist Christian high school, the Fourth Baptist Day School in Minneapolis, Minnesota. That's where I was enrolled. And as part of my school supplies that year, I was required to go get a King James Bible. Now remember, I was an unsaved kid at the time of purchasing this Bible. I'd never seen a Bible, and I remember the day that my mother took us to the Ridgedale Shopping Mall, the B. Dalton Bookstore, and we went down to the religion aisle and found the Bibles, and the mom started picking through the Bibles. And I said, wait, Mom, you can't just pick anyone. The piece of paper they sent from the school said you had to have a King James Version of the Bible. And my mother said, what does that mean? I said, I don't know, but this must be... In we were green, folks. We were just green. And I said, this, there, there must be a way to indicate it. So we started uh, rifling through the Bibles and finally came to some uh, that said King James. And so we knew that was the right one. And we purchased that. By the way, it was just a, a paper-covered Bible. I still have it in my office. The first Bible I was ever uh, purchased for by my mother. little paper-covered Bible, just a school supply Bible. And so we began carrying, my brother and I, a King James Bible. When we got to the school, we found that the teachers referred to that Bible as the Word of God. Later on, as we went to church, my pastor, R.V. Clearwaters, would preach from a King James Bible, and he would say, this Bible is the Word of God, and I was taught that the Bible is the Word of God. By the way, folks, may I say something? You have God's Word in your hand. Amen. You have it right here in your hand. Oh, but pastor, <clears throat> it must be uh, in manuscripts floating around somewhere. No, you've got it in your hand. The book you hold in your hand, your King James Bible, folks, please, that is the Word of God. That is the Word of God. You don't have to hunt through manuscripts and rifle through dusty piles of old papers. You have it right in your hand, the Word of God. After high school, when I graduated, I went on to college to Bob Jones. While I was at Bob Jones, it was my privilege to hear Dr. Ian Paisley. Now, how many of are you familiar with Dr. Paisley? Familiar? Okay. He is a fundamentalist from Northern Ireland. He happens to be a Presbyterian, but he's a great fundamentalist preacher <coughs> in Northern Ireland. In 1997, Dr. Paisley wrote the following words. I heard him preach. By the way, I heard Dr. Paisley preach many, many times with Bob Jones. And I was uh, unique in a group of students who actually got to speak to him after supper one night. And he told us his story of his encounter with the descendants of the Spanish Habsburgs in the European Parliament. Uh, Dr. Paisley was a member representing Northern Ireland of the European Parliament. And he told how in a, a presentation uh, that he protested, the man, well, he's a great protester, Dr. Paisley, he told how in a presentation where he held out a protest, that when he put up a protest banner, one of the descendants of one of the Spanish Habsburgs picked up a chair and hit him over the back with a chair. This is in European Parliament, okay? Things aren't so civilized over in Europe. And uh, Dr. Paisley had scars on his back from that encounter. And his scars, by the way, of which uh, Dr. Paisley was most proud. But in 1997, Dr. Paisley wrote the following words. He wrote these words in his book uh, entitled, My Plea for the Old Sword. He said this, I believe the Bible is the verbally inspired word of the living God, and because the authorized version is a faithful English translation of the original Hebrew of the Old Testament and the original Greek of the New Testament, it is the very word of God in my mother tongue. Being a translation does not alter one iota of its integrity, inerrancy, and infallibility as God's word. I believe the authorized version preserves the Word of God for me in the English tongue and that it contains no errors. I believe this English authorized version is unsurpassably preeminent over and above all other English translations. I cry out, there is none like that, give it me. And in so doing, I nail the satanic lie that the authorized version is outdated, outmoded, mistranslated, a relic of the past, and only defended by stupid, unlearned, untaught obscurantists. As its deriders and revilers pass on to the judgment of the thrice holy God whose revelation they despise, the old book, incomparable in its faithfulness, majestic in its language, and inexhaustible in its spiritual fruitfulness, continues to reveal to millions the matchless grace of Him whose name is the Word of God and who is crowned with glory and honor. I believe this book will always be the unsurpassable, preeminent English version of the Holy Bible and no other can ever take its place. To seek to dislodge this book from its rightful, preeminent place is the act of the enemy 
And what is attempted to put in its place is an intruder, an imposter, a pretender, a usurper. Those are strong words. Those are strong words that were echoed at one time in all or nearly all of our movement known as fundamentalism. Beyond that, there was a time when words like that would not have been criticized because after all, folks, we simply have the Bible. We have it. Today, however, there's a move afoot to denigrate words such as these, to weaken the message, and to ultimately alter the Bible text. Now, I'm not going to get into some deep thing about textual criticism tonight, but I'm going to give you three good reasons why we use the King James Bible. Just three basic reasons. There are reasons for this, and I'm going to give you three of them. Number one, reason number one, use of the King James Version is the historic position of the fundamentalist movement. I am unashamedly a fundamentalist. That means that I believe in the fundamental doctrines of the faith. I believe in the inspiration of the Bible. I believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. I believe in His substitutionary blood atonement on the cross for my sins. I am a fundamentalist. As such, I have separated from all those who do not hold to fundamental doctrine, those who have gone into heresy. For example, if a group denies the deity of Jesus Christ, I have separated from that group. Why? Because the deity of Christ is an essential and an important doctrine. Now, from the very inception of the fundamentalist movement, which as a historic movement can be traced roughly to the beginnings of the, of the early 1900s and really 1921 or so when the term fundamentalist was coined, from the beginning of that movement, now hear me please, by default, the King James Bible was the Bible of that movement, particularly speaking, the Schofield reference. How many have a Schofield reference tonight? Look at that. Many, many people still use a Schofield Reference Bible. Now, someone will say, well, Pastor, in those days, even among the early fundamentalists, there was reference made to modern versions. Yes, there were. Uh, you can read, for example, as I do every day, the writings of F.B. Meyer. I enjoy his devotional writings. Occasionally, Dr. Meyer will make a reference to a modern version. But follow me, please, on this. They never suggested replacing the King James Bible when they made a reference to a modern version. A reference may have been made, and occasionally I'll do that in the pulpit, usually for comparative purposes. A reference may have been made, but there was never a statement made to replace the King James Bible. That simply did not happen. So historically speaking, it is the Bible of our movement. The Textus Receptus, and that is the Greek text from which our King James Bible comes, that of course supersedes the fundamentalist movement uh, roughly speaking, and I'm speaking in generality tonight, and I know that, the Textus Receptus and the Byzantine manuscripts from which it came have been the Bible for the church for 1,800 years of church history. That was the Bible. It was never questioned as the New Testament until the middle of the 1800s. So for over 1,800 years of church history, the Greek text from which we get our King James New Testament was absolutely the Word of God viewed as infallible and authoritative by all the church for over 1,800 years. By the way, it was a settled text, a stable text. And then in the middle of the 1800s, something happened. We'll get there in just a moment. The King James Bible has maintained its preeminence in the professing church now for nearly 400 years. It is the historic position. It is what we have used as fundamental Bible believers, but even going beyond the fundamentalist movement as a historic movement, it is what all orthodox believers used in one language form or another, going all the way back to the Greek Testament era, it is the Bible of the church and was unquestioned until the middle of the 1800s. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me say something. If you subscribe to the modern Greek text called the critical text, if you subscribe to that text, then you must also believe that for over 1,800 years, God hid His Word from His church. And that God had only left His church with a very imperfect Bible that needed a series of improvements at the hand of man to come up with what we have today. Which, by the way, is not an improvement, but a confusion because no one has settled upon their, their critical text. We'll get there in a moment. So, 
Number one, it is the historic position of the fundamentalist movement. Number two, now here's another reason why we use the King James Bible here. And hear me on this, please. There are no compelling arguments for changing from the King James Version. There are no compelling arguments. I have read them all. I see no reason to make a change. None. Well, you say now, Pastor Shirley, with all of the multiplicity of versions available, there's got to be a reason. Well, I don't want to impugn anyone's motives, but modern Bible translations make a lot of money for publishing houses. But when I examine the reasons that are given, there is not one compelling reason for anyone to change from the King James Bible. Oh, but Pastor, what about understandability? Uh, After all, that King James Bible is hard to understand. Well, we've had over 100 years of modern Bible versions. And so since all these modern versions have come on the scene, over 100 years of them, you would think that all of America would just understand the Scripture. Because after all, we have it all. in. uh, We've got version after version. Doesn't everyone understand today? Ladies and gentlemen, listen please. There has never been a day in the history of the United States of America when biblical ignorance was at a higher level. The modern Bible movement has utterly failed in planting the Word of God into the hearts and minds of people. We have more biblical illiteracy today than ever before. The Bible as a volume is less familiar to the masses today, though modern versions have multiplied, particularly in the last two decades. Understandability. Somebody said, Pastor, it's difficult to understand those words. Now, wait a minute. Don't use that argument with me. As soon as you use that argument with me, you're telling me that you or me or someone else is incapable of learning. Now, please listen to what I'm about to say. Did you know, ladies and gentlemen, that we have all consistently throughout our lives learned new vocabulary? Mr. Preacher, what do you mean? I quit vocabulary class when I was in elementary school. You have continued to learn new vocabulary. And I'll prove it. Computer speak. I missed computers in high school. I was, I'm just, just like two or three years too old for that. We didn't have computers in high school. I missed it in college. No one in college had a laptop or a computer in their, their room. When I went to school, we just didn't have that. Nobody had that. I missed computer speak. And later on, somebody said, Pastor, it's necessary for you to understand how to use a computer. And when I got a computer, they started to use language, and it was brand new terminology to me. I mean brand new. Megabytes and gigabytes and all kinds of terminology. You know, look, I had a typewriter. Now they call it a keyboard. Okay, you're wrong if you call it a typewriter. And on and on. New terminology. Now follow me, folks. Guess what? As this new discipline has developed in its universality, I have learned the vocabulary necessary to understand the use of my computer, and so have you. Every time a new product comes out, you're expected to learn its name. Fifteen years ago, Palm Pilot? What's a Palm Pilot? And now almost everyone knows. Why? Because human beings are capable of learning. Now follow me what I'm saying. Since you as a human being are capable of learning a myriad of new words because new technology demands you learn these words, can you not learn some of the older words that have fallen out of general usage? Are you not capable of learning anything new? The modern Bible people say, that Bible version is too hard to understand. If you say that, then you're telling people they are incapable of ever learning anything brand new. They can never learn a new trade. They can never learn a new sport. They can never learn a new board game. Why? Oh, that new board game that just came out. Oh, I wouldn't want enough. We shouldn't even bother trying to play that new board game because it's just too hard to understand. People don't say that, do they? There is an assumption that in newer disciplines there is the ability to learn. So the, the idea of um, lack of understanding, that falls flat. By the way, let me say this. There has not been a significant shift in English language usage in the last 20 years. Now, turn your brain on with me. 20 years ago, every fundamentalist was using the King James Bible. Has the English language changed that much in 20 years? No, it has not. 
We can still read the things that were written 20 years ago. We can understand those. Well, Pastor, it's just because you grew up around the King James Bible. No, I didn't. I was completely green. It was my eighth grade year before I ever opened one. You say, well, Pastor, did you understand it all immediately? No. No one could possibly understand all the Bible immediately. It is something that is learned. We've seen in recent days people come to Christ. And guess what? When they come to Christ, we've given them a Bible. Bobby here is an example of that, sitting right here on the third row. She's trusted Christ as Savior. She has a Bible. And guess what? It's a King James Bible. And guess what? She understands it because she's smart and she's capable of reading. And the English language has not changed that much in the last 20 years. Why alter the version now? Certainly not because of understandability. Uh, people can be taught. Well, somebody said, okay, Pastor, not understandability, but accuracy. That's why we should change accuracy. Well, let's talk about that for a moment. Somebody will come to me and they'll have their, their modern version in their hand and they'll say something like this. Pastor, this modern version of the Bible, it's more accurate to the original manuscripts than is your King James. Therefore, you should change. And then out of the same mouth will come these words. Well, Pastor, now you need to understand that the differences between the modern versions and the King James Version are so small and insignificant, they really don't affect any doctrine. Now, wait a minute. Over here you told me that you have a more accurate Bible, and you seem to think that that's important, that these differences are important. Then over here you tell me, ah, oh, the differences are insignificant. They could fit on a half page of paper, which, by the way, that's not true. But the insignificance are di and the, the differences are insignificant. Don't worry about it. You can use anyone you want. Let me ask you a question. Which is it? Which is it? So you see, the truth of the matter is there are significant differences between the versions. You cannot argue both directions. And if you truly do believe that the differences between, a, say, a New American Standard and a King James Version, if you believe that they are insignificant differences, then listen, listen, why don't we all just stay on the same page with the King James Bible? I mean, if you believe they're really insignificant, stick with the one we've been using. Don't introduce a new one. When you introduce a new one, you are a focal point for division, controversy, and doubt. Because you brought in the new one. Hey, I've had my Bible for a long time. You walk up to me and you say, well, I've got a Bible that's better than yours. Nah, 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 nah. Mine's better than yours is. Guess what? I'm going to rear up. Hey, yours is not better than mine. <laughs> I'm going to react. If you really believe that the differences are that insignificant, do not introduce division within a church or within the movement known as fundamentalism by pushing a modern Bible version. After all, you've stated that the differences are insignificant in your view. If the modern versions are more accurate, why has their text, gone, their text basis gone through so many additions? The United Bible Society's Greek text is in its fourth or fifth edition, the Nestle Aland text, this is another Greek New Testament, modern Greek New Testament, is in its 27th edition. 27 editions. That means there were 26 that came before this one. Oh, Pastor, by the time they got it down to the 27th, they got it right! No. A 28th is on its way. Why? Because these people love to tamper with the Word of God. Add, delete, and change. You don't have a new edition unless you have changed something from the former edition. So all of a sudden, the 27th edition is not the Word of God. It's now the 28th. And later on, it would be the 29th. Ladies and gentlemen, where does it ever end? It ends when you simply believe that the text of the New Testament is settled in the Textus Receptus. According to some scholars, the multiplicity of so-called Bible texts has made the text of Scripture appear to be a mirage rather than a present-day reality. It is interesting, I quoted at length in a recent lecture I gave a man by the name of Dr. Maurice A. Robinson. Dr. Robinson is a professor at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. That's a Southern Baptist seminary. Dr. Robinson said this, that to subscribe to the modern text of Scripture, the new text that has come out, to subscribe to that text, he said, relegates the whole of Scripture to a mirage, something that appears to be in the distance that you reach out to and never quite grasp. 
And I think that is very descriptive of the modern text of the Bible. So many different versions come out. Oh, Pastor, what's the newest one to come off the press? We're grasping for something and we never quite reach it because as soon as we open that one, another one comes off the presses to take its place. Let me ask you, has God held His Word from His people? No, sir. No, sir. You have it in your hands. So if the concept of understanding falls flat and the concept of accuracy is not really an issue, and it is not, the modern versions are very inaccurate based upon the multiplicity of their editions, if that is true, then what is the reason that we would switch? There is none. There simply is no good reason. There is no good reason to set this on the shelf and open up the Pandora's box of a multiplicity of versions. There's no good reason. Well, Pastor, I just don't understand the these and thous. Okay, let's get this straight. Thee means you. Thou means you. Everybody got that? Good, let's move on. You just learned something. Incredibly simple. By the way, may I make this statement that people who are so eager to update the words of the Bible are not eager to update Shakespeare. They almost treat Shakespeare in a higher level of reverence than they do the Word of God. It's a scary thing. There's no good reason to change from the King James. Number three, number three, there are many compelling arguments to continue using the King James Bible. Many compelling arguments. There are two classes of these arguments, and let me give them to you quickly. Number one, a theological argument, okay? And let me give these to you just as quickly as I can. Use of the King James Bible presents a stabilized text a text that speaks with authority and sounds like the Bible, not common speech. Now, somebody said, oh, but Pastor, the King James English of 1611, that was common speech in 1611. No, it was not. It was not. They did not speak that way. You say, Pastor, how do you know? Compare Shakespeare, which was contemporaneous, to the King James Bible, and you'll find that the speech patterns are vastly different. The King James Bible is what we call biblical English. It sounded different to people of its day, and it sounds different to us today, but it presents a stabilized text. It is simply speaking always the same. That's important. Because today no one's quite sure what is the Word of God since when you hear it quoted in some places, it doesn't sound like the Bible. And the words change so dramatically and the text itself changes so dramatically. Another theological argument is this. The use of the King James Version maintains the doctrine of preservation. God's Word preserved in the Textus Receptus for the professing church since the first century. In other words, this. The Bible has never been lost. I believe that not only did God give His words, individual words, by verbal inspiration, but that God preserved those words, and in preserving them, those words were available to the church. You say, Pastor, what did the church use for 1,850 years from the time of the apostles until the middle of the 1800s? What did they use? They used the Textus Receptus, or the Byzantine manuscripts that were later collated to form the Textus Receptus. That is what they used. That means God preserved His Word. Now watch this. If God preserved His Word in that Greek text and our King James Bible is an accurate translation of that Greek text, if that is the case, then why would we need an update? Did God change His mind? You're either going to tell me that God failed to preserve His Word or that God changed His mind. I don't think so. But if you believe in the modern versions of the Bible, then all of a sudden everything becomes fluid and destabilized. And that is a danger to preservation. Thirdly, the use of the King James strengthens verbal inspiration. Now follow me please on this. We believe in the verbal inspiration of the Bible. The word verbal means word for word. God gave His words. That means that the very words of Scripture, the Hebrew in the Old Testament and the Greek in the New Testament, are vitally important. You don't mess with the words. They're established. They do not change. They do not alter. There is no fluid nature to them. They are not elastic. They cannot be interchanged with other terminology. God-inspired words. In like manner, the text of the Bible that we use in the English is a settled text. 
The words do not change. The expressions are not fluid. It stays the same. And when we match our English translation to the Hebrew and Greek philosophy or our doctrine of verbal inspiration and understand the significance of the words, all of a sudden we have a document that is settled. As soon as you decide that you can change words, add them or delete them, you are subtly undermining the doctrine of verbal inspiration because you're saying, after all, the words aren't that important. Now, I want you to um, look at something with me, if you will. Um, close your Bibles for just a minute. Just close them. Just close them. We're going to do something. Close your Bible for just a second. Nobody peeking. Okay? <laughs> Don't peek in your Bible. Don't want you to peek. Now, I'm going to show you something in the Bible. Okay? Put this up here. This is fast becoming, by the way, the most popular version in the English, the New International Version. That's why I'm dealing with this. Here's a verse from the New International Version of the Bible, 1 Timothy 3.16. Now, I'm going to read it to you. Follow along in the overhead. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of our religion. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up into glory. Who is that talking about? Who is it talking about? Come on. I'm confused. Who's it talking about? Who, let, who is manifest in the flesh? Christ. Christ. Do you all agree that that's talking about Christ? Don't, don't be afraid. You all think I'm going to trick you, okay? <laughs> You're right. It is talking about Christ. But wait a minute. That's not what the Bible says. Let's look at the next one. You're right. Here's our New American Standard. And by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh, was vindicated in the spirit, beheld by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up into glory. Who's it talking about? Christ. Jesus Christ. Well, pastor, that's obvious. It's talking about Jesus. What does the Bible say? You're right. But wait. Those two are missing something vital. Something so important as to shake a fundamental doctrine of the Word of God. Something so key that any version of the Bible that makes this change, I dismiss it completely. You were right in saying that it's speaking of Christ, but look at what the King James Version says. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh. Now, God manifest in the flesh is Jesus Christ. You understand? So you were correct. It's God that was manifest in the flesh. You were correct. It's Jesus that was manifest. But here the Bible says God. And do you see that the Bible states that God was manifest in flesh and that Jesus Christ is God, a very God, and He is deity? Well, you say, Pastor, but those other modern versions, we understood that to mean Jesus. Yes, but if you take away the word God, you no longer have the argument for His deity. Does everyone here see that? absolutely, vitally important. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is a significant theological change. You are correct to say that it's speaking of Christ. But in our King James Bible, it says God was manifest in the flesh. Some of the pastor, now the modern versions, they must have a reason for changing the word God to the pronoun He. They claim that they do. They have one manuscript where, and this is getting too deep, but we'll go there anyway, they have one manuscript, which was a manuscript that was erased over, crossed out, and edited by possibly ten different editors. One manuscript in which the little crosshair of what is called a theta is faint. This manuscript has been examined under microscope, and the pressure point of that crosshair is visible, but the ink has faded over time. The difference of that crosshair in the circle of this particular Greek letter and the lack of that crosshair means the difference between the pronoun he and the name God or theos for God. The absence or supposed absence of that little line in one manuscript among over 5,300 manuscripts is the reason for taking God out of that verse and examined under a microscope the pressure point of that tiny little mark is there even in the manuscript where it appears to be missing. Now, folks, 
God was manifest in the flesh. Don't you ever rip the crown of deity from my Savior's brow. That is a fundamental doctrine. And that is why, for the sake of accuracy, we continue to hold on to the version that we have. That's just one example among many. Use of the King James promotes faith, not doubt, or rationalism. Modern texts developed from a rationalistic process without reference to faith and sound doctrine. The men who translated the King James Bible were men who believed that it was the very breath of the living God. They handled it as such. In the 1950s in Oxford, I believe it was the library at Oxford, there was discovered by an American scholar a sheaf of notations that had been taken by a secretary during some of the committee meetings for the translating of the King James Bible. This secretary took notes about discussions of words and choices and how to translate phrases. And if you were to examine the notes of the secretary, it is interesting how they labored over every word and phrase and syllable of the Bible we have in our hands. At one particular point, there's page after page after page of argument and debate over the use of one particular word and its translation in one of the Gospels. These men were reverent because they knew they were handling the words of God in the original and they needed to convey them accurately in the English. And they accomplished just that. The use of the King James Bible promotes faith. These were men of faith. They were men of sound doctrine. Our modern versions come as the product of rationalism. They come at a time when Darwinism and the thoughts of Darwinism had swept all of academia and all of the very academic disciplines. And so they're born out of a rationalistic view of a continuing winnowing of a text to create a text that is different vastly from our King James Bible. And you say, preacher, what are you getting at? I'm simply saying this. If you want accuracy... If you want accuracy that the church has used for over 1,800 years before there ever was a modern version, the King James Bible in the English is what you would want to use. Now let me give, lastly, some practical, those are theological arguments, quickly some practical arguments. Um, use of the King James Bible enhances public worship. You say, how is that, preacher? Notice on Sunday morning we have a scripture reading in our church. Do you know, folks, that a responsive reading, the audience reading back to the, the individual who's leading the responsive reading, that is almost unheard of in churches today simply because they can't agree on a version of the Bible. When everyone's carrying something different, a scripture reading, a responsive reading, is not in harmony, but it becomes a babble of different sounds heard throughout the audience in the auditorium. So, oh, so but Pastor, we could solve that. Let's just put the scripture reading in the church bulletin. Doesn't that take away? from the authority of opening the blessed old book and reading the Scripture. And by the way, as soon as you start to print the Scripture reading verse by verse in the church bulletin, pretty soon people see no reason to carry their Bible to church. And when you stop carrying a Bible to church, that is a church that is in grave, grave danger. Because the Bible is the Word of God. The preacher is not the final authority. The Bible is the Word of God. Never forget that, how important that is. So its use enhances public worship. We have a Scripture reading... In our church, we elevate that to an important part in our public worship. Use of the King James Bible encourages Bible memory. Do you know, ladies and gentlemen, that years ago it was standard that children by a certain age would have learned literally hundreds of verses. Today, Bible memory is in many places a thing of the past because of the great choice of Bible versions available. No one can settle on them. And by the way, why memorize something that will just be updated next year? Seems kind of vain to go for word-for-word -word memorization. Well, Pastor, now, as long as they get the concepts, you don't need them to memorize the very words. You're denigrating verbal inspiration. The words are important. The words of Scripture but if you have a Bible that's updated every few years, why memorize it? You'd have to go through and update your memory work every few years. Do you see how it could discourage that? Use of the King James Bible differentiates the Bible from other literature. I said a moment ago, this Bible sounds like the Bible. I was in a funeral service, oh, months and months ago, conducted by a different pastor who used a different version of the Bible. He read something but did not say right away that he was reading from the Bible I didn't recognize it. It sounded like normal speech and flowery words, but did not sound like the Bible. 
what is wrong with differentiating and having the Bible sound a little different so that people understand that we're reading from the authoritative Word of God? In 1611, when this Bible was read, it sounded different from the speech on the street. It is an ignorant argument to say that it was the speech of its day. It was not. It was biblical English, and it sounded different. It is good for the Bible to sound like the Bible. Use of the King James Version familiarizes the next generation with the most influential document in all of human history. Now, please look this way. We are cheating our kids when we thoughtlessly wrest from their hands a document that has had more impact upon the world and Western civilization than any other document that has ever been penned. Don't you lightly set aside this Bible, because in so doing, you're taking a document from the hands of your children. There was great debate a while back concerning the concept of amending our Constitution. Great debate about that. If we were to rewrite our Constitution into the slang speech of our current age, so to speak, if we were to do that, there would be great debate. It would be hotly contested. And I think I'm accurate to say that all of the conservatives would say, oh, no, 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 don't touch it, don't touch it, don't touch it. Just leave our Constitution alone because they'd be suspicious that the liberals, John Kerry and his wife. (laughs) Come on, folks, just laugh. They're going to slip something in. They'll slip it in in a sneaky way. And so the conservatives would say, keep it just as it is. If we revere our Constitution to that level, why in the world don't we the Word of God? The words of the living God. Our next generation should be familiar with its text. They should know of its cadence. They should thrill at its translation and its sound. They should be able, as I am able, and as countless ones in this room are able, to, when a Scripture verse is quoted in their mind, watch this, in their mind, quote along. You know, when I quote a Bible verse, you know what you do? You have maybe never thought about this. When I quote a verse, many of you in your mind, you follow that verse along just as I'm quoting it. And if I ever misquote it, boom, a red flag goes up in your mind. Now, you maybe don't stand to your feet and call me a heretic. I'm glad you don't do that. But right away, you, 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 hey, he misquoted that. He didn't get that word right. How many of you like pinto beans? Do you love pinto beans? I do. I love pinto beans. Boy, back in North Carolina, I used to fix what I called killer pinto beans. I haven't done it in a long time. They were good, though. Boy, I'm telling you what, you'd, that was an experience that went well beyond the initial eating. Let me tell you. Uh, and, uh, and I learned to cook these pinto beans. I, I like doing it. But when I first started doing it, nobody told me that you had to wash the beans. (laughs) I'm being honest. Nobody told me that. I just took the beans, put them in a pot with the water and the onion and lots of salt and some fat back. Ooh, lots of fat back. Put that all in. I didn't wash them. Maybe that's where part of the flavor came from. I didn't wash them. I didn't strain them. I just put them in that pot, and then they'd cook for several hours, and all those juices would mix together. Oh, it was glorious. And then Kelly baked some cornbread, and I'd have my big bowl of pinto beans, and I'd start eating. One time I was eating away and just having a good time. I mean, the texture of those beans was good and they were soft and the flavor and the juice and it was running down my chin. I was just having a good old southern North Carolina time. I took a big bite, got that in my mouth, and I bit down on something. And it was a piece of gravel. And I said, gravel in my beans. I knew I didn't put it there, so I said, honey! She didn't put it there either. I later found out you need to strain the beans and wash them to get... Sometimes there's rocks. Sometimes there's other stuff, okay? Ladies, wash them for homecoming, okay? Just strain strain them. There was rocks. Reading a modern Bible version to me is like that. You can read along, everything's going just fine, and then all of a sudden you hit a piece of gravel, and it sets your teeth on edge. When I quote a Scripture verse from the King James Bible, you're following along in your mind. If I misquote that... It's like chomping down on a piece of gravel. Why? Because it is familiar. When the modern versions take over, that familiarity will be completely lost. And lastly, let me say this. The use of our King James highlights God's absolute authority and God's holiness. Unchanging, absolute authority. 
I do not have the quotation in front of me, but a while back I read a book by a secular author. The book is entitled God's Secretaries, The Making of the King James Bible by Adam Nicholson, I believe is the name of the author. Mr. Nicholson does not claim to be a Christian. He is not a churchgoer. But he wrote a book that details the history of our Bible and some of the translating committee and all of the things that uh, underlined the history. Very interesting book, a book that I would commend to your reading. And in the end of the book, very last chapter, Mr. Nicholson says this, something like this, and I'll paraphrase. He says, I'm not a church-going individual. He said, part of the reason I don't go to church anymore is because the sound of authority is no longer heard in the pulpit. He said, the wording of the King James Bible is the sound of authority. And the words of that brand of English could carry the freight that the Bible requires. That's how he put it. But he said, modern English and the modern translations do not carry that freight, do not sound with authority, and the message of the church has become indefinite to the point that I no longer see a reason to attend. This is from an unsaved man. Preacher, why should we use the King James Bible? Well, because we always have. Point number one. Preacher, why should we use the King James Bible? Because there's no good reason to change. None whatsoever. I've looked at them all. There's no good reason. Preacher, why should we use this Bible? Because theologically, it is the best. And because practically, it keeps us familiar with the very words of the living God. I'm saying this. Let's just not change. Now let me make a statement. I'm 37 years old. If I ever preach from any different version of the Bible, you have my permission to pick up a hymn book and throw it at me. I will not change. I just won't. Pastor, what if, what if years from now it's so difficult? It won't be. That's silly. People are still struggling through Chaucer. By the way, did you know your King James Bible technically is written in modern English? Don't call it Old English. You're being inaccurate there. It's modern English. All right? I just will not change. You're looking at a guy who'll never put that down. I will not change. No good reason to. And there are plenty of reasons to stay right where we are. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Lord, we've covered something a little different this evening. Father, I pray that our message tonight would help us to fall more in love again with the Bible as the Word of God. Lord, thank You that You've never left Your people without the Word, that they've always had a perfect Hebrew and Greek manuscript or a version in their language that was good and sound and based upon those. Thank You, Lord, for the Word of God as it has been translated into so many tongues and languages. And God, that so many people groups can marvel at the wonder of Your grace. We thank You for that. Help us, Lord, to understand even in our day that the changes that are so sweeping tend to be more fads than anything else. Help us, Lord, just to hold on to what we've always held on to, believe what we've always believed, and simply stand where we've always stood. God, we wouldn't pick a fight about this with anybody, but we don't want to change. We're not interested in it, and we're not going to. And Lord, I pray that You'd bless that stand. Father, Your Word has been blessed for hundreds of years, for thousands of years, as You gave it to the apostles, to the prophets of old. Now, God, help us to cherish every syllable of the blessed Book of God. Use the message, Lord, to strengthen and increase our faith. Thank You for the Bible that You preserved for us. May we love it more, we pray in Jesus' name.